Welcome back. One of India's leading and fastest growing homegrown wellness brands, Vadam, has an interesting playbook that saw it grow significantly by first marking its presence across the globe. So how did Vadam go from India's tea gardens to Oprah's recommendation list and the Oscar hamper? Founder Bala Sada speaks to Delshad Irani about how the brand grew and has evolved and what's next for this global Indian brand. Hello and welcome to Story Bar 18, Bala. It's lovely to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Dilshad. My pleasure to be here. So, so Vadam and you have had a really fascinating and interesting journey so far. And it's interesting to me because you have sort of uh, managed to sort of establish the brand in a global market in a fairly short amount of time. So if I could just, if we could just sort of dial back and talk a little bit about what what the sort of the key points in your strategy has been so far uh, in terms of what's the secret sauce. Let's just talk a little bit about that first. Absolutely. So no, thanks uh, Dilshad uh, for having me once again. Uh, uh, I think um, honestly, there's no secret sauce. Uh, when I started Vadam uh, seven and a half, eight years back, I think there were three, four, um, you know, things which I noticed in the market. Uh, of course, when you go deep in the in your market research, when you talk to consumers, which is what led us to start Vadam. Uh, one of them being the fact that India is one of the largest producers of, of tea. Uh, of course, it also produced some of the world's finest spices. Um, uh, to give you some numbers here, right? 25% of the world's production of tea happens in India. 80% of the world's turmeric, for example, which is one of the most popular spices in the world, uh, is, is done in India. But unfortunately none of these products were being sold in global markets by Indian brands. These were all generally and traditionally exported at single digit margins by bulk exporters from India to foreign brands, you know, who would then sort of, you know, brand it, package it and send it to consumers. Um, and, and while, um, you know, a lot of categories, that's something which can work. My, my simple question, uh, uh, you know, to, to customers and to the market was that, you know, unlike fine wine, liquor, or whiskey, you know, tea and spices lose flavor with time, right? So when you have so many middlemen um, in between uh, the farmer and, and the consumer sitting somewhere in a foreign land, uh, you know, the quality of the product goes down, right? Because it just passes so many hands and there's obviously a big time it takes to, you know, get to these consumers. Uh, and while growing up, you know, I had, of course, tasted teas in the gardens here in India. And, and you know, and of course, then tasted some of these products in global markets. And I realized that there is a there is a, there's quite a difference and there is a big opportunity to make available a much fresher, higher quality product to consumers. Um, the second insight was actually um, in terms of, you know, how, how we believe that there was a gap for a brand. Uh, and again, you know, very, very simple analysis that, you know, when you look at our consumption patterns as consumers, right, we generally trust products from origin, right? If you want to buy wine from France and chocolates from Switzerland and, you know, your apples from Kashmir and, Alfonso from, you know, from Maharashtra, um, mangoes from Maharashtra rather. But for some reason, uh, you know, I realized that Twinings of London was selling more Darjeeling tea and a Starbucks in the US was selling more chai than any Indian brand was even remotely doing, right? And I said, this does not make sense, right? Because the consumer is expecting a more authentic product direct from origin. And if he can sort of take that with a very genuine story, I think, uh, you know, there is, there is an opportunity to also differentiate uh, on the brand piece. And Dilchar, I think thirdly was around distribution. Uh, you know, um, uh, a, a, a consumer brand is as good as its distribution is because, you know, we were very clear that, of course, in a foreign land, having an exceptional quality product, a very strong and authentic brand story are something very, very critical. But how do you get this to consumers, right? It's it was very easy to say that we will build, and this was a 23-year-old me eight years back, uh, you know, with a very ambitious idea of, you know, building a global brand, which nobody had done in a category where we had a ticket to win, right? It was not something, uh, you know, uh, something which was something outside of that scope, right? It was something we had a fair ticket to win, but still nobody had been able to do anything. And and the, the reason that was distribution, right? Because how do you go and build trust as an Indian brand? How do you distribute your product? How do you reach the millions of people and tell them their story? And I think that's where the internet came in. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I was very, very sure from day one that, you know, the internet will democratize global consumer brand building. India has, legacy Indian brands have sort of made some sort of mark um, 
on the global stage, but it's very specific to certain sectors, IT, for instance, right? But when it comes to more consumer facing brands, uh, brands like, for instance, yours, um, it's been a different story. But if you were to distill your thoughts into how, how sort of uh, it's evolved for made in India brands on a global stage, I mean, not just talking about the traditional sectors like IT, but how would you distill how it's evolved over the years, um, you know, to, uh, to sort of the perception of India and the perception of uh, made in India brands on a global stage? Yeah, no, Dicha, that's a, that's a very, very relevant question. Um, and, and, and you're absolutely right. I think, you know, if you really look at across industries, I right, look at, of course, you mentioned IT, if you look at BPOs, if you look at even apparel for that matter, right? India has been the back end um, of all of these industries, right? For this last several years, and, and my only sense was that, you know, I think this is now India's time to be the front facing brand as well, right? In, in front of consumers. Um, and while of course, IT is more B2B, it was critical that, you know, we also have consumer facing brands from India. And that's honestly one of, you know, for me, uh, one of the reasons we are so passionate about this business is also, we believe it's critical for us as a country to also have consumer brands, uh, you know, uh, globally, which are recognized from India because they help build the trust of the country. I think if you really look at this, this immediate war, which happened between Russia and Ukraine, right? I think um, we, everybody realized that, you know, uh, uh, not only have having enough troops or a high GDP is not only how you become a superpower, right? It's, you know, the power of brands, you know, when US decided to sort of shut off brands in the region of Russia, right? We all very quickly realized the power of brands in today's world, uh, and to be honest, that was really the yearning for us as a business or as a team or me as an entrepreneur, uh, in addition to the fact that you can build a lucrative business. I also believed that, you know, it's, it's, it's high time we do this um, and build a trusted brand from India, which would then help other entrepreneurs to sort of come forward and, you know, build brands in several other categories as well. Um, that's the sort of the massiness of the Indian market and perhaps the commoditization of tea and wellness products in, in some regard. Does that put you off in any way? No, absolutely. Uh, Dilshad, I think two very important questions. One, to sort of set the record straight. I think for us, India was always about when should we do India rather than if we should do India or not. I think India is a incredibly large uh, uh, tea drinking market, um, a very large size market. But for us, the idea was that, you know, in the 24 hours we had as a company, as a team, as, a, as, as an entrepreneur, we decided that creating impact outside will be, uh, will be more beneficial for us uh, initially. Uh, so that's number one. And that's why we chose US and, you know, Europe as markets to initially focus on. And, you know, uh, of course, they, they are also larger markets in terms of size in this category. Um, and we will continue to focus on them. That said, I think India, we are now looking at India very, very seriously, because, uh, you know, I think post the pandemic, I think uh, there has been an upward trend anyways, in, you know, in consumptions, in the consumption of products, um, in the wellness space, tea being one. Um, and, and we believe it's now the right time for us as a team also to sort of look at India. It is time for a break. Up next on the sidelines of Technomobile's new ultra premium smartphone launch, we are catching up with Arijit Talapatra, CEO at Technomobile India, speaking about making an entry into the ultra premium segment of smartphones. What is it like being a late entrant in the highly competitive Indian smartphone market? And also joining us for a conversation, we have a special guest on the show, Ayushman Kurana, who speaks to us about association with Techno and how he chooses to endorse his brand. Thanks.